With us, the journalist and pro-independence campaigner Ruth Wishart, the deputy political editor of the Scotsman Conor Matchett, and the political commentator and pro-EU campaigner John Edward. Now is the winter of our discontent. The big freeze is underway and so are the strikes. This week we'll see the RMT walkout and also more posties on the picket line. But Conor, Unison and Unite members in the NHS accepted the Scottish Government's offer today. That's probably the first bit of good news the Health Secretary's had in a while, isn't it? I think it is. I think you could probably hear the sigh of relief from St Andrew's House and Butte House um, for miles around today, echoing off you know, the icy, <laughs> icy roads. Um, I think it's a massive bonus for, for Hamza Yusuf to get this out of the way, particularly before the budget on Thursday. Um, but there, there's, there's big issues about the agreement itself, but also, you know, what's coming down the line. It's not an overwhelming kind of stamp of approval of this pay offer. Um, I think 64% of Unite members, 57% of Unison members, you know, that's that's a pretty split union in terms of accepting it. And we've got the bigger issue of Royal College of Nursing potentially, you know, striking in the future. Um, it is great news, particularly given it involves ambulance workers. That's, that's going to be a massive relief given the already major struggles on A&E numbers. Um, but it's more to come, and this will have to be baseline for next year. Um, I'm sure John Swinney already thought about that prior to Thursday, but it could they could really do with some additional money coming from the UK government to help pay for all of these pay deals. Because the, the un, union, Unison, said tonight that it was more of a, a warning than a win, didn't they, Connor? Yeah, and I, I think that's probably underlined by the fact that we're likely to see this whole process happen all over again next year. Um, these are pay deals for the year that we've basically just had rather than for the coming year. Um, it, it's likely that we'll ha we're here, um, union members doing all of this all over again, particularly if inflation stays high. It's a really difficult situation for the politicians, given that they are committed to providing, you know, supposedly inflation busting uh, pay deals to these workers, particularly after Nicola Sturgeon made such a big deal about ensuring that we pay health workers rather than simply clap for them following the pandemic. This is going to run and run until there's a major change in Scots Scottish finances. Ruth, are you backing the workers or do you think they're asking for too much here? Well, it's, I feel quite ambivalent about it, to be frank, because I am backing the workers in as much as all the people. If you look at these um, requests, demands on paper, they all make perfect sense because everybody that has as all these public sector workers have served us well and are working hard. I mean, I had to chuckle at Brian Menteith saying in your report that um, you know we we mustn't penalise the, the the very wealthy who work so hard. I mean, that's that's not that's not my understanding of of today's Scotland. However, having said that, I think all the workers who are threatening strike action just now have got a very good case. I also think, however, on the other hand, that the the finance secretary, the acting finance secretary, has got an absolutely impossible job because if you were to give everybody a pay rise commensurate with the rate of the current rate of inflation, then the budget would completely tank. So it's a very, very difficult situation. I, I don't have a problem actually with them. Um, Income tax rises in as much as it's a very progressive tax. It means that if you if you earn more, you pay more. And, and I've always found that really equitable I, I, idea. But as you pointed out yourself, uh, Colin, it will mean if we if we go with a sort of forty thousand rate, it will mean that it will catch a lot of people who are in already in the public sector. A lot of people, as you said, in the police force, a lot of people in the health service who will be in these kind of, that kind of money. I just hope they feel as relaxed about progressive taxation as, as, as I do. John, do you think there's public support for these strikes? I think in principle there is, yes, because, you know, as, as Ruth and, and Connor have said, nobody denies the right of, of public sector workers to get a decent pay in view of inflation, and especially at this time. But I think there is a there is a broader issue which both have touched on, which is that something about this doesn't feel quite right in that you've got a, a huge series of disputes happening all at the same time at um, historically low temperatures when you've got everything else going on with energy. And it's almost as if the broader system in terms of determining these things just can't keep up. We've got public uh, pay review bodies. We've got the Office of Manpower Economics and so on and so forth. But it seems to... Be that when those are confronted with the bigger issues of Ukraine, of Brexit, which uh, your previous correspondents mentioned, and of all the problems that COVID have left behind in terms of workforce supply, 
general supply of goods and other things is that you need to have a, a more sophisticated system to to plan ahead for these rather than coming back. I mean, I, in the world of teaching, I know a bit about it. This is the, the second major dispute over pay in less than five years. Well, this is the last Monday night panel of the year and we talk a lot about politics. We've talked a lot about politics so far. So who is your politician of the year? Ruth, first, let's see your pick. Well, I've picked uh, Joanna Cherry, and I know she's not everybody's cup of tea, but I've picked up her two broad reasons. One is that I think she's a politician of conviction. I thought it was a real mistake for Ian Blackford to kick her off the front bench in Westminster, because if you've got a very talented um, KC with a, a proven track record of, of in, in in judicial matters, then I think it's a bit silly then to get rid of her and, and, and appoint somebody with, with who hasn't got that skill set particularly. So she's not I back also, on the front bench yet after this reshuffle, though, is she? No, and I think that's because she made it quite clear, as I, as I understand it, she made it quite clear to Stephen Flynn that she wanted to um, stick with the job that she fashioned for herself as the the chair of the of the joint. Um, Parliamentary, parliamentary Committee on uh, Human Rights. I think she's decided to point herself in the direction of human rights. And in fact, she has touched on various current political matters when she was um, dissing the, the, the current Justice Secretary attempt to bring to get rid of to bring his own Bill of Rights in and get rid of the European legislation. So I think she's found herself a niche there. And of course, the other uh, the other area where I think it's, it's slightly unfortunate from a, a, a political point of view, you have two outstanding female politicians in Nicola Sturgeon and Joanna Cherry, and it's no big secret that they don't actually care for each other. And Connor, one's not enough for you. You've gone for a double act tonight, haven't you? Greens in government. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, this is potentially a bit of a left-field pick, and I'll admit that, but I think it's important to recognise why the Greens went into government uh, last year, and it was to deliver things to ensure that the people who voted for them in the first place continue to do so in the future and also to prove that Greens in government get things done. And I think if you look at their record this year, particularly the rent freeze bill, um, which will have been pushed through behind the scenes uh, with, against serious opposition for the SNP, who are, who are not particular inter interventionists in the rental market, um, is a really big milestone for them. Um, the other aspect of their domestic policy that I think is going to be a huge hurdle for them to, to jump over will come probably next week with the Gender Recognition Act if it passes. That was a massive red line for them in their uh, deal with the SNP last year. If they get it over the line, they'll have done most of their job for the, for the term. John, let's see your choice. <laughs> so you've gone for Politician of the Year Rishi Sunak, which even his own party didn't go for initially. Exactly, yeah. And I didn't go for him because I necessarily admire the man in any shape or form, but uh, I suggested him, on top of lots of other proposals for people in Northern Ireland like Naomi Long and Liam MacArthur on assisted dime, but Rishi Sunak was one of the few people who had the guts to wield the knife against what was undoubtedly the most unserious, least public service spirited, most absurd Prime Minister we've ever had, and the man who came with a list of public health warnings as long as your arm so if nothing else um he deserves a little bit of a nod for getting rid of his predecessor as prime minister i noticed that none of you went for nicola sturgeon as your politician of the year or anas sarwar who actually won the award a couple of weeks ago connor why why not so i i i'm i deliberated long and hard about this and very nearly picked nicola sturgeon i think if the Scottish government had won their court case, case in the Supreme Court. Um, she would have been the obvious pick. I thought she put herself and the independence movement on the front foot for the first time in a long time. You um, I'm yet there, to be you? convinced. <laughs> I'm yet to be convinced, on the other hand, by Anna Sawa, who I, I don't think Labour have fully recovered yet. Um, and I think it will take more than just a handful of polls following the trust government to, to demonstrate that they're on the right track. 2023 for me is yep. the make or break year for the Labour Party under Anasawa. Ruth, what did you make of the others' picks and, and my suggestions there? Well, I mean, I, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon is a is a is a first-rate politician. There's no, there's no question of that in my mind. But um, 
I think, um, for my taste, she's an overcautious First Street politician, but that's just my own personal take on it. Um, as for Anna Sarwar, I mean, I was fascinated by John Curtis, everybody's favourite um, seafological guru. John Curtis saying that Keir Starmer had virtually written off Scotland in terms of getting Labour elected to Westminster because he was so fixated on getting his red wall vote back again that he'd more or less decided that he could win without Scotland, which of course he can. So. I don't think that I don't think there's a I know there's a head of steam building up with some of the commentary saying that you know Labour are on the way back in Scotland, you know show workings please. <laughs> Where they've got one MP. John, very briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Nicola Sturgeon's award mantelpiece is probably pretty full anyway, and I think an as was suggested will be judged partly on how high the the general tide of Labour rises across the UK. But um, I think it's, I think it, it, Connor's right to say it's a bit of a time of transition. You know, we've got two sets of elections coming in the middle distance okay. and people's preparation for them in the year ahead is what's really going to matter. I'm going to stop you there. And I noticed that nobody picked the Scottish Secretary, Alistair Jack, despite surviving three cabinet reshuffles and three prime ministers. <laughs> 